In this video, I'm going to go through solutions to part 081, Exercises Matrix Algebra. As with all the exercise videos, I recommend that you do these exercises or at least attempt them before watching the solution videos. And there's always a link to the exercise document in the video description. All the code that I'm going to show you in this video is going to work in Octave exactly as it's shown here in MATLAB. All right, starting with some very easy stuff. Calculate the dot product of a and b using the dot function compared to the answer displayed below. So I've got a solution right here that we can compare to. But all I want on this one is to use the dot function on a and b. And there it is. We get 32. For both of them, this is just a confirmation that you did the dot product correctly. Anytime I refer to practice problems, unless I say otherwise, they come from MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition. So here's just a very simple book problem. And it's basically the same as the previous example. We just want to calculate the dot product of the two vectors and then do a comparison. And honestly, it's a little bit silly because the code can look exactly the same. And there we go. This time we get 125 and we verify it by doing it two different ways. Please, however, if you are ever asked in my class or any class to do a dot product, don't do it this way, please. Use the function. It's just more readable and easier to type out. All right, a group of friends goes to a burger joint and they have a variety of items that they're ordering here. And if we dot product the counts of how many of each item they order with the prices of each of those items, we will get the amount that they owe for their final total order. And that turns out to be 1549. Now it asks us to redo the previous question using a transpose and a matrix multiplication. But let's actually just start off with the matrix multiplication and see what we get. All right, we get an error because the dimensions don't match up. And another thing that you might very reasonably do here is just use the size function to figure out what those dimensions are. All right, and we see that they're both one by fives. So we need to transpose the second thing that we're multiplying to make this multiplication work. And there's the 1549 right there. I maybe should have suppressed these or put a CLC in, but it's the same uh, total price that we got in the previous uh, question here. All right, this one tells us to open up the PowerPoint to answer this question. I will also link to this PowerPoint in the video description. So there are actually four questions here, potentially eight, depending on how you're counting it. And the questions are, can you multiply A times B and then also B times A for one, two, three, four pairs of matrices? And so this is really a question about the dimensions of the matrices. And the solution is actually provided in the PowerPoint, so I'm not going to take the time of typing all these out into MATLAB and doing the multiplications, but you could do that. So I'm going to move on to the solution slide, which is the one after this one. And so what this is saying here is that for this matrix A and this matrix B, can we multiply A times B? No, we cannot. The symbols they're using here are supposed to denote that we cannot do that. And it's because the inner dimensions don't line up. A is a 3 by 2 and B is a 3 by 2. When you try and multiply, the number of columns of A does not match the number of rows of B, and that's what has to happen. And switching it around and trying to multiply B times A doesn't work either. Now on number 2 here, where A is a 3 by 2 and B is a 2 by 3, we can multiply A times B, which will produce a 3 by 3 result, or we can multiply B times A, which will produce a 2 by 2 result because those inner dimensions match up in either case, and the outer dimensions become the dimensions of our result matrix. And then similarly, and it's kind of silly on number three here, because it's basically just A and B's dimensions are reversed. So obviously you can still multiply them in either order. It's just this time when you multiply A times B, you get a two by two instead of a three by three, and also the B times A is switched. Now number four, I think is quite interesting because for this one, we can multiply A times B because the inner dimensions do match up. The number of columns in A matches the number of rows in B, but we can't multiply B times A because the inner dimensions do not match up in that case. And continuing on downward in the MATLAB here. So this is an inverse question. How do we get the inverse of M and also multiply it by itself to show that we get an identity matrix? I'm going to use the inverse function right here and name my new variable m underscore inv. Now I could have also done m raised to the negative one power, but I don't like that as much. And then what we need to do is multiply m times m inverse or, or vice versa. We could do it the other way around as well. Either way works. So there's m inverse and here's something close to the identity matrix 
because of rounding errors, there is not a zero right here, although this number is very, very close to zero. Calculate and display the determinant of each of these matrices, and then if there is an inverse, display that as well. And we get some interesting results here. There's nothing special that I know of about magic matrices and whether or not they have determinants, but this actually gives us a nice spread of different results. This determinant right here suggests that A definitely has an inverse. This determinant right here, uh, I would say suggests that B does not have an inverse because this is very, very close to zero. And this is a suspiciously large number, but I do believe that it indicates that C also has an inverse. I'm gonna try and display out the inverse for every single one of these. All right, the inverse of A displays out perfectly fine. The inverse of B, we get a warning. Yeah, that one probably is not a valid inverse. And the inverse of C also displays out with really no problem right here. Even though the determinant is a very large number, sometimes our intuition about whether or not that's a reasonable value is effective and correct, and other times it's not. It can be difficult unless you've seen a lot of different examples of determinants, but this is a perfectly fine determinant. The determinant that indicates that a matrix does not have an inverse is zero, and only zero. And because my students at least just need lots and lots of practice on functions, there is also a question about functions. So let's try and fill this in. So write a function that takes two numeric matrices as inputs, and the function is going to get the determinant of both matrices and check if the first matrix has a larger determinant than the second. If so, it's gonna return the element-wise sum of the two matrices. Otherwise, it's gonna return the element-wise sum of the inverse of the inputs. Now, why would you ever wanna do that? I have no idea, and that's why I suggest that you name the function weird funk. And then here is a setup to test the weird function, and another test with the inputs swapped because we should get a different result from that because we're adding up different matrices. We're adding up the inverses on this one right here. All right, so I may need to refer back to those instructions because that was kind of a lot, but let's open up a new tab, start with the keyword function. There is going to be a returned value. I'm gonna name it matrix. It's just a new matrix right here. And then this equals weird funk. And I'm just gonna keep the input names the same. We'll just use A and B here. Now I need to get the determinant of A and also the determinant of B. And then I believe the instructions told me to say if the determinant of A is bigger than the determinant of B, then we are going to simply return the sum of the two matrices. Otherwise, we're gonna return the sum of the inverses. The instructions don't really tell us what to do if one of these matrices does not have an inverse, and that's fine. It's just some arbitrary practice for us. And that looks good to me. I'm gonna save it and then go back over here. And there we go. So here's our first sum, perfectly fine. And here's our other sum, and that's perfectly fine. Just because the input matrices have nice whole numbers doesn't mean their inverses will also. Oh, and there's actually a solution already provided, so let's go compare. Yeah, and that's pretty much what I did, except uh, in this example, for whatever reason, I chose to save this information in two separate variables, and instead of just asking for the determinant inside of the condition right here. And I also named my return variable slightly differently but it's basically the exact same thing. And that wraps us up for this exercise.